We are happy and thankful to be here again tonight because we are not in the fires of hell where we should be because of our sins. We are here tonight to encourage each other in making the journey to heaven. We are here as pardoned criminals in the court of heaven. By the blood of Christ, our sins can be pardoned. And then, when he pardons our sins, he enrolls us as soldiers in the army of the Lord. So we're in a fight for the rest of our lives to save our soul, to save our husband, to save our wife, to save our children, to save this church, to save every person that can be saved. And in this fight, there is no retreat and there is no surrender. We will fight to the last breath. We will fight to the last moment to go to heaven. That's what it's all about. It is serious business. And thank you for inviting me and encouraging me again as we labor together in the gospel. Thank you for every word of encouragement, every prayer. Thank you for your hospitality. Enjoyed being with Sandy tonight and Brandon LaDonna. And you always lift me up when I'm here. I will ask for your prayers as I proceed from here to Palmer for the next lesson or the next series of lessons. And then another meeting at Anchorage after that. And then finally at Soldotna, the Lord willing. Remember, after we study, we always make time for an open forum. So if you think of questions as we study tonight, make a note of it so that we can circle back and hear your questions. We would love to hear your questions. Now, we've been studying God guides us to heaven. And as we think about God's plan of sending Christ and then establishing the church and then spreading the gospel to the whole world so that all men have this opportunity to be saved, the end of all of that is either in heaven or hell. And so I want to speak to you tonight on the subject, death and what then? We start in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, where the Bible teaches that God gathers our souls at death. We do not pass out of existence. Some people have the idea death is like turning off these electric lights, that when the switch is off, that's the end of it. And that's not true. The Bible says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, the physical aspect of the body, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So no, we don't turn the light switch off and that's the end of it. The Bible answers questions that we have about death and the hereafter. Every sober-minded person knows he will die. I'm going to die, you're going to die because we live in the land of the dying. And so we want to answer the question, why is that? Why must we die? The Bible answers that. The next question, what happens when we die? What is that experience of death like? Another question, what happens in Hades, the realm of the dead, where God gathers our spirits? Next, what happens when Jesus returns? The Bible answers that. And then, what happens in heaven and in hell? The Bible answers all of these questions. So first, why must we die? I want to back up before we address death and explain that God created us to live and not to die. It was not God's purpose in putting us into this world that we should die. So go back to Genesis 2 for a moment with me, please. And let's refresh our minds how time began. In the beginning, God gave man the gift of unending fellowship with him. But also he gave man a choice regarding that relationship. I want to read now Genesis 2, verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. 
Every kind of delicious food was in the garden. Next, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. This tree renewed the strength and the health of Adam and Eve every time they ate it. And it prevented the invasion of sickness or injury or the aging process. As long as they could eat from that tree, the body was perpetually strengthened for life. I want you to see that God did not create us for death. He created mankind to live in the garden with him and that would have been without death. But I didn't finish reading the verse, did I? And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now some ask, why in the world would God make that tree? We don't know what the fruit was, but it means this. If you cross the line and go to that tree to eat, you cross the line between good and evil. And there is a very good reason why it was put there. The animals serve God by instinct. They don't have any choice. A bird must do what a bird must do. And a fish and all the rest of them. But he did not create us that way. He created us with free will. And we're not forced to serve God instinctively. It is by choice. And that is the reason for that tree. Now drop down to verses 16, 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. Do not cross that land. Do not go to that tree to eat. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So it means that tree could be called the tree of sin and death. God put man in the garden with the tree of life so that he could live in unending fellowship with God. But God was not going to force man into that relationship. And this other tree gives the choice. You may go to the tree of life. You may go to the tree of sin and death. There are consequences to the choice of mankind. Now then Satan eventually came into the scene. We do not know for what period of time Adam and Eve lived in that beautiful state of fellowship with God. But we know the time came that Satan deceived man to eat and to die. So we turn to Genesis 3 now in verses 4 to 6. And we're going to learn that Satan caused the first death that entered this world and all cases of death that have followed. And before I read it, I want to emphasize something. Every infant that dies, dies by the work of Satan, not God. All the way to the most aged people that die, even those after 100 years of age. In every case of every death, death is the work of Satan, not God. And I'm emphasizing this because people sometimes talk about trying to comfort somebody. Your baby died because God wanted another angel in heaven. God wanted another star in the heavens. And so we're attributing death to God. And that's not accurate. That's not accurate. Genesis 3 verse 4. The serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. God has forbidden you to eat from the most wonderful tree in the garden. This tree will elevate you to the level of God's. You will establish your own standard of good and evil. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, 
and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. This is the work of Satan, deceiving Adam and Eve so that they crossed that line and went to that forbidden tree by their own choice. And so if we drop down to verse 24, here's the final consequence of that decision. The Bible says, so he, that is God, drove out the man, he sent him out of the garden, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, those are special angels, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now to keep here means to guard, to prevent Adam and Eve from coming to the tree of life. And so whose work was it that brought death into the human family? It's the work of Satan. So when your husband or your wife dies, it's the work of Satan. Your child dies, it's the work of Satan. Your parents die, it's the work of Satan. Your grandparents die that you love, it's the work of Satan. Do not attribute death to God. Death is the consequences of sin that entered into the world because of the work of Satan. Next question, what happens when we die? What happens when we actually die? The Bible answers that the soul will leave the body, but it will leave the body alive and conscious, entering into a place called Sheol or Hades. In Ecclesiastes 12, 7 again, it said, Then shall the dust return unto the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So the body will rot, literally. It will deteriorate and turn back to dust. But the Spirit is still alive. The Spirit enters a realm called Sheol or Hades. God gathers our spirits. We are still conscious and alive. Let's take just a moment to define those words. This Hebrew word Sheol, used in the Old Testament, means the place of conscious existence after death. Do not miss that word conscious. Conscious existence. Nelson's Expository Dictionary of the Old Testament on page 371. Now, the equivalent Greek word the equivalent Greek word is Hades, defined as the nether world, the unseen world, the realm of the dead. In the Septuagint, the Septuagint is when they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek language. In the Septuagint, the Hebrew, the Hebrew word Sheol, is almost always rendered by this word, by Hades. The common receptacle of disembodied spirits. That's Thayer's Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament on page 11. So notice that Hades and Sheol are the very same thing. One is a Hebrew word, the other a Greek word. Our spirits live in the human body. That's how God made us. But the time comes that the spirit will be disembodied it is separated from the body. And both of these definitions show that in the realm of death, the spirit is still very much alive and conscious. And now we're going to show you that directly from Scripture. We are gathered alive and conscious with all people who lived and died before us. Just think of making a journey as we answer the question, what happens when we die? What happens when Ron and Donna come to Fairbanks? Well, we know that you're here and that you're alive and that you're active. And so we're coming to the company of people who are alive and active, as we are alive and active. Well, think of this in the same way. The only difference is it's the gathering of spirits, not fleshly bodies. That's the difference. 
So let's go to some passages. In Genesis 25, 8, the time came that Abraham died. And the Bible says of this, Abraham was gathered to his people. Now that's referring to his spirit entering the world called Sheol. It doesn't mean he was placed in a grave next to his relatives. Some of you are familiar with a religion called Jehovah's Witnesses. And there are others who believe as they do that when you die, the light goes out because there's nothing else alive. The body is dead and the spirit is just no more. And when they encounter verses like this, they try to get around it by saying, it's just a picture of a graveyard. And it is common that you bury relatives next to relatives, right? So they make this mean Abraham was going to be buried next to his relatives. The problem is that won't work. Who remembers the name of the place Abraham came from? Ur of the Chaldees. And if you look at a Bible map, he first traveled 600 miles from Ur to a place called Haran. And he stayed there several years. Then another 600 miles down to the land of Canaan. So he's 1,200 miles from his home where his relatives are buried. And so he died in Canaan. He did not die in Ur. This cannot be a reference to his body being laid beside his relatives in a grave. It cannot mean that. He was literally gathered to his people in death because he entered the Sheol world where the spirits of his relatives were alive. Let's look at another passage. I think we remember the story of Joseph. His father is Jacob, of course. And his brothers envied him because the father treated Joseph as his favorite. And the brothers sold him to merchants going down to Egypt. And you remember the brothers then took his beautiful coat of many colors and dipped it in animal blood. And they brought that coat back to their father because they're going to have to explain where is Joseph. And they let the father believe that this was evidence Joseph was eaten by wild animals. We all know that story. Now, in Genesis 35, 37, as Jacob is grieving, he says this, and I'm going to read it from the English Standard Version because this is the most accurate way to translate that verse. Jacob, thinking of his own future death, said, I shall go down to Sheol to my son. To my son. Where is his son? Now he thinks the body of his son was eaten by animals, right? So he cannot mean then my body will be eaten by animals. It can't mean that. And it also cannot mean I will lie down in the grave next to my son Joseph. Because to his knowledge, his son did not have a grave. His son was eaten by wild beasts. So do you see the only meaning that could have? I shall go down to Sheol to my son. His son is alive. He will go to see his son again someday when he dies. This cannot be a reference to the body in a grave. It cannot. Now then, if we go to Genesis 49, we come to the time that Jacob died. And here's what the Bible says that when he died, it says Jacob was gathered unto his people. You'll remember he was in Egypt at that time. And I hear again that Jehovah's Witnesses and others will try to interpret that to mean laid in a grave with his relatives. It cannot possibly mean that. At the time he died, he had relatives, but where were they buried? In Canaan. His relatives were buried in Canaan, and he wanted his body to be laid with his relatives. And his body would later be carried to Canaan and laid in the grave with his relatives, Genesis 50, 13. But Genesis 49, 33, when he was in Egypt and died, that is when he was gathered to his people. 
So this is referring to the spirit, not the body being gray, uh, being buried in a grave. Now let's turn to the New Testament for a moment. When Jesus had a debate with the Sadducees, <clears throat> this was a group of Jewish religious leaders who believe the same thing the Jehovah's Witnesses believe today. That when the spirit, uh, that when, yes, when the spirit leaves the body, the light goes out and there's nothing. You do not exist. Now Jesus did not believe that. And in Matthew 22, 32, he quoted what God said to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3, verse 8. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. So now first think of a timeline. Abraham died, Isaac died, Jacob died, and then it was many years later that Moses came on the scene. And here is God telling Moses, I am still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm still their God. If he's still their God, they still existed. And Jesus drew that inference. God is not the God of the dead. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not dead. Those spirits are alive. Not the God of the dead, but of the living. God was alive. Abraham was alive. Isaac was alive. Jacob was alive in the time of Moses, in the time of Jesus. How about today? They're still alive. They are still alive. Think about Christ on the cross in Luke 23 when he said in verse 43 to the penitent thief, Today shalt thou be with me where? In paradise. Because in the Hades world, the place of the dead, there is a paradise. And when Jesus died, he entered that place. And by promise, in Psalm 16.10, he would enter that place, but not remain in that place. But he entered the paradise of Hades at death. In Luke 23.46, as he died, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So when Jesus died, the lights did not go out, and that was the end of his existence, but rather he entered that paradise of the Hades world, and so did the penitent thief. Now in Luke 16, 22, there's something beautiful that every person in this room needs to learn and remember, because you are going to die and we all have the question, what will it be like? What will happen when I die? It will be like this if you are a faithful Christian. If you are a faithful Christian. It will be like the case of Lazarus in Luke 16, 22. It said the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. So my point is this, on your deathbed, be ready for the angels to come. That's literally what happens. To bring you to Abraham's bosom. Why is that place called Abraham's bosom in the Hades world? Because Abraham lived and died by faith in God. So it means where the faithful go is where we go. If we are faithful like Abraham. Now, I know none of us is going to volunteer to die. God doesn't want you to do that. He has a purpose for us in life. But I do want to say, do not be afraid of death. Death could come accidentally at any time. Or for many of us, it may come just through the aging process and we know I'm getting closer to death. And I might be on my deathbed aware that I will soon die. And no matter how we die... If you are a faithful Christian, do not be afraid of that moment. You'll close your eyes the last time and angels will carry you to Abraham's bosom. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear. 
Well, when we go to that Hades world, what goes on there? What happens in Hades? Well, Jesus opened a window to the Hadean realm in several passages, but the most detailed occasion is Luke 16, verses 19 to 31. Jesus explains how two men entered Hades and what was happening in Hades. So we will know what to expect if we understand this passage. Now in verses 19 to 21, we meet two men in opposite stations in this life. Very opposite stations. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Here is a rich man that had everything his heart desired. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Did this poor man have medical attention? Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. That was his medical attention. Now, you could hardly think of two people in more directly opposite stations in life. They both were Jews. They both believed in God. But this rich man was not willing to lift his finger to help his brother who laid at his gate of his mansion. Now, at death, the story radically changed. Their souls entered opposite stations in the Hades world. Let's read verse 22, 23. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, which tells us Though this man was in terrible poverty, he was rich in faith. He was rich in faith. He lived and died by faith in his Lord. And the rich man also died and was buried. And I can only imagine what a grand funeral he might have had. But the next verse said, and in hell, I'm using the King James translation, to be more precise, more accurate. If you have any newer translation, it says Hades. The reason for this confusion is there is a Greek word Gehenna that is the place of torment with Satan forever. Gehenna. Then we have this other word Hades. That's not the place of Satan. But Gehenna and Hades are both translated hell in the King James Bible. So it is more accurate to understand this is not Gehenna yet. This is Hades, the realm of the dead. And in Hades he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So yes, he did enter torment, but not the eternal place of torment. That comes later. This is the temporary place called Hades where all of the dead go. But some of the dead go to Abraham's bosom or paradise and some of the dead go to torment. All of them are in Hades. Now their destinies are sealed in Hades. Let's keep reading. Go to verses 24 to 26. In verse 24, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. How interesting. <laughs> All of a sudden, he's interested in benevolence. But when he had the opportunity to serve poor Lazarus, he wasn't one speck interested in benevolence. Let someone be benevolent to me. Can they not see my needs? 
But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. Now there's an implication before I keep reading. It means you had plenty and Lazarus had nothing and you did not lift your finger to help that brother of yours in the Jewish faith. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Now we need to do a short sidebar here for a moment. You can see that when we enter Hades, you cannot change your status, right? But in the Roman Catholic religion, there is a way to change your status. It is called the doctrine of purgatory. The Catholic religion divides sin into two categories. There is mortal sin, and they consider that the more serious sins, and there is venial sins, according to them, less serious sins. Now they teach if you die guilty of venial sins as a Catholic, you go to purgatory, and actually they teach that almost everyone who dies will die with venial sins. So we go to purgatory, and what happens in purgatory is you are tormented, you are punished, you are chastised for thousands, maybe millions of years until God will reach a point that he will transfer you to paradise. And in the meantime, if the relatives of the dead person will approach the priest to conduct masses, for which they will pay good money. If you do enough of these masses, it can shorten the time in purgatory. Now that's impossible because the Bible says when people enter the Hades world, those in paradise cannot transfer to torment. Those in torment cannot transfer to paradise. There is no purgatory. Now, a little bit more insight into this Hades world. The disembodied spirits of faithful Christians or saints are with Christ in that paradise of the Hades world. Turn with me please to Philippians 1, verse 21 to 24. Philippians 1, verses 21 to 24. When we depart this life and enter the Hades world as a faithful Christian, we will be in closer union with Christ in that Hades world and then later in heaven we will be in the most intimate union with Christ forever. Philippians 1, 21. Paul is writing this from a Roman house arrest and he doesn't know what the decision of the Roman authorities will be. Will they release him or will they execute him? And he wrote this, For to me to live is Christ. If they let me live, I will go on serving Christ. And to die is gain. If they execute me, there's a benefit. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. I have work to do serving Christ. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. W-O-T means to know. I don't know what they will do with me, so I don't know which choice it will be. For I am, an, I am in a strait, a tight place betwixt two, having a desire to depart. Now look what will happen if he dies, if they execute him. Depart and be with Christ. Paul is not afraid to die, is he? Which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. If he is spared, he can go on serving the brethren. But Paul is not afraid to die because he knows the angels will bring him to Abraham's bosom, to paradise, 
and there to be in closer union with Christ. So here is that Sheol or Hades world where every dead spirit has gone from the time of Adam till this very hour. They're all there, alive and conscious. Some are with Christ in this place of paradise, Abraham's bosom. Some are in terrible torment, but they're all in Hades. There's a great gulf that separates those two realms, and no one can transfer from the one to the other. When we die, if I die this moment, there are preachers who've died in the pulpit, if I die this moment, instantly I will be in one of those places and stay there until the resurrection. God forbid, but if you were going home tonight involved in an auto accident and died, you will go there alive and conscious. I want to dwell on this a little more about being conscious because this bothers people and people ask questions about it. Let's try to help that. In Hades, we're conscious of being the same person with the same character that we had in this life. If you are a righteous person, a faithful Christian, that's what you will be when you die in Hades. If you're living in your sins, in rebellion against God, that's who you will be in Hades. But you will know it, and you will know who you are and why you are there. Did you notice in Luke 16, both the rich man and Lazarus knew who they were? And what else? They recognized each other. Did the rich man recognize that Lazarus was over there in Abraham's bosom? He sure did. Because he cried out, let Lazarus come help me. So the rich man knows I'm the rich man and he knows that's Lazarus over there. That's how it will be if I die or you die tonight. You'll know who you are and you'll recognize others in that world. I reference again Matthew 22, 32. That Jesus said Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive because God is the God of the living. So notice, if Abraham is alive, who is he? Well, he's Abraham. <laughs> and if he's Abraham, he knows he's not Isaac or Jacob. And if Isaac is alive, who is he? Well, he's still Isaac. Nothing has changed. And Isaac knows I'm not Abraham and I'm not Jacob. I'm Isaac. So I want you to have time to meditate on these passages and realize if you die tonight, if you enter the Hades world, what will it be like? Well, you'll be like what you are right now. You'll be what you are right now in that world. And that's why we must prepare every day, every moment to be right with God. Here's a passage that sheds more light on this. We know the story of David and Bathsheba. He committed adultery with Bathsheba and a baby was born. David was hoping and praying the baby might survive, but it did not survive. In 2 Samuel 12, 23, there's a powerful, beautiful statement made by David. When the baby died, David said, I shall go to him. I shall go to him. Now listen, when we try to analyze, do we know who we are and do we know who others are when we enter that world of Hades? The answer is yes and yes. David understands that. That when I die, I'll still be David, and I can know my infant is there when I get there. So yes, you will know who you are, and yes, you will recognize others who are there. Well, let's go further in this. What happens when Jesus returns? All the dead will be raised. That's the first thing that will happen. 
Turn to John 5, 28, 29. The bodies and the souls of all people will be reunited when Jesus returns. John 5, 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. The dead people are going to hear the voice of Christ as he returns, calling them out of the grave, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Remember in John 11 when Jesus called to Lazarus, the dead man in the grave, what happened? Jesus said, come out, and he came out. But the next time, he's going to call all the dead out of the grave, just like he called Lazarus out of that grave. On that day at that moment, our spirits receive new bodies, new bodies. Let's study just a few minutes the most detailed passage in the Bible that explains this. It is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 to 44. And what we're going to learn is this. Our new bodies will never die. And if that sounds impossible, remember that nothing is impossible for God. And if God promises that our bodies will never die, our bodies will never die. 1 Corinthians 15, 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Now this is an interesting passage for a lot of reasons. One reason it's interesting to me, people then were not one speck different than we are. They were puzzled by the resurrection. How does this work? How does this happen? And you can see good reason for it. We've been reading that when we die, what happens to our body? It rots. It turns to dust. How, how do you gather that dust up and turn it into a body again? But what about the people that die in a fire and the fire is so intense there's not even any dust to gather up. Now how are those bodies going to be raised up? And, and, what about the people that died in the ocean with a shipwreck and the sharks ate them? Maybe five different sharks ate that one body. How are you going to raise that body up? Now do you see how people begin to reason, how are the dead raised up? This just, I just don't know if that's really possible. All right, let's read the answer. Thou fool, that means you're speaking foolishly. That which thou sowest is not quickened or made alive except it die. Meaning when you plant a seed, it seems to die before it sprouts. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. You don't plant a corn stalk. What do you plant? Just a kernel of corn. You don't put a whole apple tree in the ground, under the ground. You just need an apple seed. All right? Now, he said, That which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Now, now take the time to analyze what he's saying. Here's this little tiny corn seed. You put it in the ground. It seems to rot and die. But now what eventually happens? A corn stalk comes up and produces many kernels of corn, many corn cobs. So that first body and the next body were both made by God and they're also connected. So if it troubles you to think, well, what about when my body will rot as dust, or my body might be burned, or my body might be eaten by sharks? It's just not a problem to God. It might be a problem to our reasoning, but it's not a problem to God. 
he can create bodies like that. Now it said all flesh is not the same flesh. He's going to show us God has been in the business of making bodies for a long time. There's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, animals, another of fishes, and another of birds. God knows how to make bodies, even a resurrected body. Another illustration, verse 40. There are also celestial bodies up in the heavens and bodies terrestrial down here on the earth. <coughs> terrestrial bodies. Think about it. God makes volcanoes. God makes continents. God makes lakes. We could just keep going. How many kinds of bodies he has placed all over this earth? But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun. Now, even up in the heavens, there are different bodies. And another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. And we, more than any generation who ever lived, can appreciate that last statement the beauty, the glory, and the distinctiveness of each star because we send these satellites up with powerful telescopes and I'm sure you've seen some of the pictures of what's up there. And God made all of those celestial bodies. Is it a problem for God to make a resurrection body? It's not. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So this is not a problem to God. He's been in the business of making bodies for a very long time. Now drop down to verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Something that's coming and that will appear. We shall not all sleep. Sleep is a euphemism for death. Some of us will be alive when Jesus comes. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, never to die. For, or and, we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So our fleshly body that will die will be raised, you're the same person, but when it's raised, you're given a spiritual body. And this is not a problem to God. And God will announce our final destinies on that day. Turn to Revelation 20. Here's a picture, and you will be there. You will be there. There used to be a TV program. You are there. It would take you to different things in history. Well, in this case, you are there. This is something that's coming, and you will be there. Revelation 20, 11 to 15. Our destinies for eternity are set and determined by the lives we live now. And the most important question right now is, is my name, is your name in the book of life? Revelation 20, 11. We will all be there. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, we will be there. Stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened which is the book of life. Those who are faithful Christians are written in that book. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now verse 13, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, but that's Hades, delivered up the dead which were in them, 
and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. There will be no more death and no more Hades because no more dying. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So I will repeat, the most important thing is, is your name in the book of life. Here is that Sheol world. And some in the paradise of the Sheol world, their resurrected body goes to heaven. Others are in the Sheol or the Hades world in torment because of their sins. They did not repent. They were never baptized for the remission of their sin. They will be raised and that resurrected body cast into hell forever. So that leaves one more question. What happens in heaven and hell? We will find the highest joy serving and praising God in the closest fellowship with Him in heaven forever. Do you know what makes heaven heaven? It's not streets of gold so that you can walk around and fill your pockets with gold. That's just a figure of speech for the beauty of heaven. What makes heaven heaven? God. You are with God forever. That's heaven. It's the highest joy that you could ever experience. You will love Him and serve Him and praise Him in a place that Satan can never come and there will be no sin. Let's read just a little picture of that in Revelation 21. Please look with me in Revelation 21, verses 1 to 5. We will have a new home in heaven with God. And what will that place be like? I've traveled a lot around the world. I think Alaska might be the most beautiful place I've seen, but Alaska cannot compare to this. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I've been to a lot of weddings. I don't think I ever saw an ugly bride. A bride prepares herself to look beautiful. Heaven will be beautiful beyond compare and will be holy. That means Satan is not there. There's no sin. There's no temptation in heaven. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. The tabernacle was a tent where they came to worship. And now it's like saying the place of worship is open for men to enter. And he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. We will enter God's home forever. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death. How about that? No more funerals. No more graveyards. Neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write. For these words are true and faithful. Now there are people who will tell you that heaven is a myth. That it's just a child's bedtime story. Do not believe that. These words are true and faithful. Just as surely as we are in this building in Fairbanks, we can be in heaven with God someday. God's presence. I'm going to try to answer a question now that bothers many people. 
God's presence will overshadow every loss, including one of the most terrible losses, those that we love who have turned away from God. Even people near and dear to me have reasoned out, surely we could not know who we are or we could not know who other people are because I would know my loved ones are lost. Yes, you will know your loved ones are lost. But here's the answer to that. God's presence will overshadow that sorrow. God's presence is so great. God's presence is so glorious. God's presence will fill your heart and remove every shadow of pain and sorrow. You just will not experience that pain and sorrow. But in hell, the lost suffer the torment of being without God for eternity. There are a lot of figures in the Bible trying to help us understand hell. But if you shake it all down, do you know what hell is? It means dwelling where you will never see God. You will never know His love again. You will never benefit from His attention and His care. The absence of God is hell. Matthew 25, 30. Here's one of the places Jesus explained it. Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. I don't know if you've ever been in a place of total, total darkness. There are people who have been lost in caves and who survived two or three weeks with no light. In some cases, when they rescue those people, they're in complete mental breakdown because total darkness is so terrifying. Jesus said hell will be that kind of experience. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The expression gnashing of teeth is when you hurt so bad you can't even cry out to express your pain. You're just grinding your teeth in constant pain. He's trying to get the message. God is not there. And this will be hell. Matthew 25, 41 again. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now most all of us at some point have accidentally touched fire and it is intensely painful. If we're cast into hell, it'll be like experiencing fire, but it will be forever. Revelation 21 verse 8 shows there will be no rest, there will be no peace for those who have rejected God and the gospel and who will spend eternity in hell. But the fearful, let me just quickly explain that word fearful. Do you know what that means? It means timid, hesitant, afraid to obey the truth. Some people learn the truth and know it as much as you and I know it, and they just keep hesitating. They're just afraid to take that step and obey the truth they know. You might know somebody like that. The fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers, that's fornication, having sex but not married, and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Death is a separation. In this case, separation from God forever. That's the point. You do not want to go to that place. Death and what then? We are all going to die. God gathers our souls at death. The dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. The Bible answers our questions about death and the hereafter. Why must we die? 
we must die because of sin having entered our world. What happens when we die? We enter Hades. Well, what happens in Hades? We're with the faithful in paradise. Or we will be with the wicked in a torment. Well, what happens when Jesus returns? All the graves will be empty. All the dead will be raised. And we will receive a body that can never die. We will go to heaven or to hell. In heaven to rejoice with God forever. Or in hell to be tormented without God forever. If you're not a faithful Christian tonight, your name needs to be written in the book of life. When we sing this invitation song, it's one of the most important things we do. Do you realize this could be the last invitation you would ever hear? Can you realize this could be the last invitation song you would ever hear? Because if the Lord comes back, there will not be another occasion like this. Or if something happens and you die, there will never be another opportunity for you like this one. So tonight, if I'm speaking to Christians who know that you have fallen back into sin, please repent tonight and be restored to the Lord. 1 John 1 and verse 9 promises, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a beautiful picture of God's loving patience. He wants us to be restored and to be saved. So please come if you need to correct sin in your life as a Christian tonight. But if you have never obeyed the original gospel of Christ, you're living in sin. And if you live in sin and die in sin, you die without God and without hope. <coughs> when we sing this song, you can have that hope if you will come and obey the gospel tonight. The preacher said to Saul in Acts 22:16, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you have never taken that step, this is the right time and the right place that you can take that step and be saved. And then be faithful to the end and receive a home in heaven. If you need to respond to the gospel invitation, please come forward as we stand and sing this song together.